Hello, I'm John Foster, and I'm a medical doctor who does Social Security disability exams. And today I'm going to be talking about low back pain and disability. And I'm going to be focusing on advice for physicians who do disability exams. But I think this will also be interesting for patients. As usual, everything I say reflects my own opinions based on my own experience and study and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. Now, I was prompted to do low back pain because of two reasons. Number one, I listened to two very good presentations on low back pain. And number two, I managed to tweak my low back a week ago doing 54 pound kettlebell swings. I have no idea why that tweaked my back. I've done thousands of 54-pound kettlebell swings in the past with no problems whatsoever, and I was doing them with the usual form. But I did manage to cause some low back pain, and it's settling down, but it's still present today. Now, it's important to know that low back pain is a symptom. It's not a disease, just like shortness of breath is a symptom and not a disease. And just as shortness of breath can have many causes due to different organ systems, low back pain can have many causes due to different organ systems. And just like shortness of breath, on occasion, low back pain can be a symptom of a life-threatening condition. During my emergency medicine practice, I saw two patients with rupturing abdominal aortic aneurysms who presented complaining of low back pain. Interestingly, both of them thought that they had sprained their back. Low back pain is the second most common human affliction after the common cold and is probably the most expensive affliction. In the literature, it's reported that 90% of patients who develop low back pain will get better within six weeks, and that 85% of those patients will have no definitive cause. They will be idiopathic. However, the sort of patients one sees depends on one's clinical setting. And doing disability exams, the disabling condition has to have been present for at least 12 months or to be expected to be present for at least 12 months. And that means that all of the patients you'll see with back pain have chronic back pain. In terms of chronic back pain, females are more likely than males and whites are more likely than Hispanics, who are more likely than blacks, to present with chronic back pain. By far the majority of patients you'll see in a disability setting will have chronic back pain due to non-life-threatening conditions. But one thing I've learned in my 43 years of medicine is that no matter how low acuity or non-serious your clinical setting, Sooner or later, a patient will show up with a life-threatening condition. So always be aware of that. In my social security disability practice, the most serious patient I've had show up is a person who was having cardiogenic shock and angina pectoris. So it's a good idea to always keep in the back of your mind, is this something other than an orthopedic problem? Now, I can't discuss low back pain in 2023 without discussing the usefulness or lack thereof of the magnetic resonance image. And one of the big problems that I've mentioned in other videos is that when asked to describe their back pain, patients often want to talk about their MRI reports. I don't find that helpful at all for two reasons. Number one, many MRIs which are read as showing bulging or herniated discs are done in patients with no back symptoms whatsoever. 
In other words, there are many people running around with what are called bulging or herniated discs in their back who have no back pain or stiffness or any other problems related to their back. The other issue in a disability setting is that Social Security already has those MRI reports. They've already been reviewed by Social Security personnel. And if they could have made a determination as to whether a patient is disabled or not from that MRI, they wouldn't be seeing you for a consultative examination. It's very important to try to get the patient to describe their symptoms and problems in layman's language. I sometimes will tell a patient, try to describe your back problems to me as if I was a friend who wasn't in health care and had no medical knowledge whatsoever. I find that in low back pain and in neck problems, patients also tend to have learned a lot of medicalese and want to describe their problems using medical jargon. When a doctor or nurse tells me that they have radiating pain, I have a pretty good idea of what they mean. But when a patient tells me they have radiating pain, I don't really know what they mean. And I want them to describe it in their own terms. One of the things that I heard in my back presentations that I listened to that struck a chord with me is that the best test for low back pain is not the MRI or ultrasound or nerve conduction study. It's the doctor's brain taking a good history, doing a good physical, and then thinking about what would be causing the symptoms and signs. Another thing that I heard was don't just look at the back. Look at the entire patient. Like I said, not all of the causes of low back pain are mechanical problems with the lumbar spine. And I'll get into more of that later. Now, some useful questions to answer in the history are how long has the patient had back pain? Does it spread to any areas other than the back? Does anything make it better or worse? and specifically valsalva maneuvering, such as coughing and sneezing exacerbating the pain, can be a big clue as to the cause. Are there neurological symptoms in the leg? Neurological type pain, sensory alterations or loss, and muscle weakness or lack of motor control. Keep in mind that stalking type sensory loss in the legs is almost never a due to low back pain. It's a frequent complaint in patients with functional problems, but also it can be due to neuropathy. And with the prevalence of diabetes these days, it's quite possible that you'll see a low back pain patient who also has diabetic neuropathy causing a stocking type distributional sensory loss in both feet or both lower legs. On the other hand, you've all seen those beautiful pictures of uh, sensory innervation due to lumbar roots and they're so clearly demarcated and marked in different colors. Well, that's fine for the textbooks, but I can tell you that in real life, sensory alterations are not so clear cut and so defined. They tend to be more blurred. It's helpful to know if the pain is made worse or relieved by bending forward or by bending backwards. Pain due to disc herniation tends to be made worse with bending forwards and relieved with bending backwards whereas pain due to lumbar stenosis tends to be relieved with bending forward and made worse with bending backwards. Worrisome symptoms that should prompt a search for serious and life-threatening problems include back pain that wakes a patient from a sound sleep. Now, I don't mean a patient who wakes up in the morning and their back is stiff and sore. 
That's common with spondylosis or arthritis of the spine. I mean someone who's woken in the middle of the night from a sound sleep due to low back pain. Other worrisome complaints are fever, weight loss, abdominal pain, nausea, and in the female, any gynecological symptoms. If the patient has a history of a prior cancer, even if they believe that cancer has been cured, that's a big red flag and you need to rule out metastases to the back. It's extremely important to be alert for the symptoms of cauda equina syndrome, which are saddle anesthesia, which means lack of sensation in the area of your body that touches a saddle when you're riding a horse. Bladder disturbances, usually incontinence, and bowel disturbances, usually fecal incontinence, and trouble with both legs. Now in terms of a Social Security back pain exam, it's a little bit different from what you would do in a general medical clinic. You want to determine work-related limitations. And for patients with low back pain, those are generally issues with sitting. Sitting stretches the sciatic nerve. Standing, walking, heavy lifting, and heavy carrying. It's important to get the patient to be as specific as possible. If they say they can't stand or sit for prolonged times, how long is prolonged? It, it's, there's a big difference between not being able to sit for more than five minutes and not being able to sit for more than five hours. Likewise, what is heavy lifting for the patient? As I've stated before, I've treated competitive fighters, power lifters, and bodybuilders. And some of, for some of them, a 50-pound dumbbell wasn't heavy lifting at all. They could overhead press a pair of 100-pound dumbbells. It, if you can get the patient to specify how much they can lift, that's very helpful. Another thing that I found is patients will tell you, my doctor told me not to lift more than 10 pounds. Well, maybe. In most cases, that doctor was just pulling the 10 pound number out of a hat. I've never seen or heard of a doctor who actually had a selection of various weights in their office and actually tested what weight the patient could lift without any difficulty. Also, Social Security is very interested in whether the patient has any neurological problems related to their back pain. And in every back pain patient, I make a notation in the diagnosis whether the patient does or does not have neurological involvement and if so, what sort of neurological involvement they appear to have. So it's helpful to categorize low back pain into different groups. It can be acute and chronic, chronic being more than six weeks and what you'll generally see in a social security disability exam. It can be inflammatory or non-inflammatory. It can be radicular or non-radicular. It can be mechanical or non-mechanical. Non-mechanical low back pain can include such things as masses and tumors. In fact, one of the most common tumors that causes low back pain is the gravid uterus. Another thing, and I've seen this in Social Security disability patients, <coughs> is that patients with orthopedic disease of the lumbar spine are at high risk for orthopedic disease of the cervical spine, and the patient may present with symptoms and signs related to both. In particular, a patient who's complaining of low back pain, who has upper motor neuron symptoms and signs in the legs, spasticity, loss of motor control, 
hyperactive reflexes, a positive Babinski sign, should be strongly suspected of having concomitant cervical spine pathology, which may be asymptomatic. They may not have neck pain. Also keep in mind that low back pain may not actually be due to any lumbar pathology at all. Sometimes patients will complain of low back pain when what they have is disease of the sacroiliac joints or even the hips. And it's possible for a patient to have more than one disease. They may have spondylosis of the lumbar spine and also arthritis of one or both hips. The combination of concomitant cervical and lumbar stenosis is called the double crush syndrome. The spinal cord is crushed in two locations. Now, and this is just my opinion, I believe that the magnetic resonance imaging, the MRI test, has done more to confuse doctors, patients, and the legal system about low back pain than anything else in the history of medicine. Sometimes I think it would be best for low back pain patients if it hadn't been invented. When I began in practice, MRI was not yet available and CT scan was only available in university teaching hospitals. And if a patient wasn't in a teaching hospital and the doctor was really worried about their spine, they had to do a myelogram. Because that test was fairly unpleasant and carried some risk, it was only done in patients with a very high suspicion of spinal cord or root nerve compromise, and usually in patients in whom surgery was being considered. As a result, we didn't perform MRIs on thousands and thousands and thousands of patients with minimal non-serious lumbar changes. Unfortunately, the legal system, most patients and many doctors now believe that the MRI is infallible and is oracle-like in its ability to tell us what is wrong with the low back. Now, inflammatory causes of low back pain are relatively rare, but I have seen some examples in my Social Security disability practice, so I'd like to talk about them a little bit. The inflammatory causes are usually autoimmune or infectious. They tend to occur in younger folks, and often there are associated pathologies such as problems with the eyes, skin, genitourinary, or gastrointestinal systems. Also, the patients may have polyarticular problems. They may have pro problems with their low back and with other joints in their body, as in rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. They may have morning stiffness, fever, weight loss, rash, nausea, or diarrhea. Often, but not always, they'll have an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate and or elevated C-reactive protein. In terms of infectious causes, always keep in the back of your mind tuberculosis of the spine, formerly known as Pott's disease, shingles, Subacute bacterial endocarditis. Did you know that 50% of patients with SBE complain of low back pain? And bacterial discitis, usually seen in intravenous drug abusers. When seeing a patient who's had previous lumbar surgery with back pain, keep in mind the possibility of a surgical site infection. Again, it's rare, but I've seen it in my Social Security disability practice. When a patient's had previous lumbar surgery, I always like to look at the wound. Is there any erythema, swelling, 
or sinus tracts in terms of autoimmune inflammatory disease. I've seen several patients with rheumatoid arthritis affecting the lumbar spine, several with psoriatic arthritis, and one patient with transverse myelitis whose first sy symptom was back pain. The patient initially thought that they'd sprained their back. After several months, they took a long automobile trip from Florida to Michigan, and when they got out of their car, they were kind of wobbly on their legs. Again, they thought that was from spraining their back. However, the symptoms in the legs became worse, and they finally saw a doctor who diagnosed them with transverse myelitis. Now, in terms of non-inflammatory low back pain, the number one cause is either idiopathic, we have no idea why the patient has low back pain, or spondylosis, a form of degenerative arthritis. Other problems may include lumbar disc disease, lumbar stenosis, spondylolisthesis, and scoliosis. Back pain is rarely due to scoliosis, especially if the patient is young and has a mild curvature. However, as the patient ages, the scoliosis may put a strain on the back and cause spasm and pain. I've had many patients tell me that they have low back pain due to scoliosis, where I couldn't see a curvature with them sitting and could only detect a minimal curvature with Adam's forward bending test. And in those folks, I really doubt that the cause of their low back pain was scoliosis. Some doctor had done an x-ray which was read as scoliosis and they told the patient that was the cause of their problems when I doubt that it really was. Non-radicular low back pain may go to the hips and to the thighs. May also go to the buttocks. However, it should not go below the knee, especially should not go down to the feet. And straight leg testing should be negative. Patients should not have pain with straight leg raising. Here I want to note that Social Security wants to know if a patient has painful straight leg raising in the sitting and the supine position. Normally, if the patient is not complaining of low back pain, I have them do straight leg raising in the seated position as a screening test. If that's negative, I don't check for it in the supine position. However, if the patient is complaining of low back pain, has a positive straight leg raising test while seated. I'll check it while supine as well, and I'll usually include a Lasegs test. Now, with radicular pain, usually the pain will go below the knee, usually to the foot. They'll have sensory alterations, usually sensory loss, although it may be dysesthesia in the lower leg and foot. They may or may not have motor weakness, and they may or may not have hypoactive or absent deep tendon reflexes. Again, if a patient who's complaining of low back pain has signs of spasticity in one or both legs, hyperactive reflexes, increased muscle tone, clonus, or a positive Babinski sign, something is going on besides a low back problem. Now, it's important to think of whether the patient has a radiculopathy or if they have spinal stenosis, and occasionally patients have both. Radiculopathy is usually due to lateral disc herniation or osteophytes compressing a nerve. Radiculopathy tends to be unilateral, 
tends to have positive neurological signs on the exam and tends to be relieved by leaning backwards and made worse by leaning forwards. Spinal stenosis can be caused by central disc herniation or bony overgrowth in the spine and rarely due to tumors or infection involving the spinal cord or the spine. I saw one patient who had spinal stenosis and eventually caught an equina syndrome due to a myeloma in the lumbar spine. Spinal stenosis usually, although not always, is not associated with neurological symptoms and is usually made better by leaning forwards and worse by leaning backwards, which leads to the shopping cart sign, which is that folks with spinal stenosis often develop pain in the lower legs with prolonged walking that mimics arterial claudication and hence is known as pseudoclaudication. However, if they're leaning forward to push a shopping cart, they find that they can walk much further. That brings me to the next point, which is it, that it's important to differentiate pseudo or neurological claudication from vascular claudication due to arterial insufficiency in the legs. Both can present with pain in the lower legs with prolonged walking. Whenever you suspect that the patient may have vascular claudication, it's important to get the shoes and socks off and check the feet, check the pedal pulses, check the temperature of the feet, and check the skin of the feet for signs such as modeling, livido reticularis, or cyanosis. And if you find positive signs of vascular insufficiency in the feet, it's not a bad idea to check the iliac and femoral pulses as well and palpate for an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Vascular and neurogenic claudication are both relieved by rest. An interesting test, if the patient has attempted, is to ask whether they could ride a bicycle, either a bicycle on the road or a stationary bicycle. Bicycle riding will precipitate pain in a patient with vascular claudication but rarely will do so with neurogenic claudication because the patient has to lean forward to ride a bicycle. Keep in mind that a, a patient may have concomitant lumbar stenosis and lumbar radiculitis or concomitant cervical stenosis and lumbar stenosis and, or even more confusingly may have neurogenic and vascular claudication. So finally, on to some tips for the physical examination of the disability patient with low back pain. I pay particular attention to how they walk into the room, sit down in a chair, rise from the chair, lie down on the exam table, and rise from a supine position. A common finding in functional patients is that the patient will walk into the room, sit down and stand up with no difficulty whatsoever. But then when I check the strength in the legs, it will appear to be very low. So low, in fact, that if it were real, the patient wouldn't be able to stand and walk at all. Standing and walking normally is only possible if there's either normal or very mild strength loss in the legs. Most people with low back problems severe enough to render them disabled will have some difficulty sitting down and rising from a seated position and often considerable difficulty lying down and rising from a supine position. Lying down and rising up from a supine position 
produces severe stress on the lumbar spine. And what I usually see is that the patient will not sit straight up like doing a sit-up. They'll first roll on their side and then lever themselves up. If a patient's complaining of low back pain due to spondylosis or disc disease, and they can sit straight up from a supine position with no difficulty whatsoever, I'm highly suspicious that the patient's back pain is not severe enough to render them disabled. Now, in terms of functional signs, I'd like to say that as usual, I will not diagnose a patient as functional or malingering if they have only one functional sign. I like to see three, and the more the better. An interesting test for functional back pain is axial compression. The patient is seated, and the doctor places both hands on the head and presses down hard. Try it yourself. Press down as hard as you can. You will find that your neck will be uncomfortable, but absolutely none of the force is transmitted to the lumbar spine. If the patient complains of marked low back pain with axial compression to the top of the head, it's likely that their problem is functional. Next, Social Security wants you to record the range of motion of the low back, and they want you to check the ability to bend forward, bend backwards, and bend to each side. For some reason, they don't need the ability to twist to either side. As mentioned before, they want you to check straight leg raising in the seated and supine position. I check the back for any deformity, for surgical scars, for muscular spasm, and for tenderness. Here's an interesting point. Many patients I've examined with severe low back problems have no tenderness to palpation. Remember, the lumbar spine structures are deep, and simply pressing your fingers into the low back is unlikely to disturb them. Conversely, many functional patients will complain of severe pain when I just brush my fingers lightly over the skin of the back. Next, it's important to do a neurological evaluation of the legs. You want to check sensation, muscular strength, and deep tendon reflexes at the knee and the ankle. If there's reflex hyperactivity, I have the patient take their shoes and socks off and check for a Babinski sign. I also will often check the Hoffman sign, which is called the Babinski sign of the upper extremities. If the patient has hyperreflexia, or clonus, or Babinski's sign, or Hoffman's sign, they don't have plain old low back pain due to their lumbar spine. Something else, usually something more serious, is going on. If the patient states that their pain goes to their hips, I will check the hips because, again, hip arthritis or hip problems may be felt in the low back and or the patient may have low back pathology and hip pathology. So I test for tenderness and range of motion of the hips. Finally, I check the gait and I'm particularly interested in the patient's ability to walk on their toes and on their heels. If they can walk normally on their heels, we know that the L5 motor function is normal. And if they can walk normally on their toes, we know that the S1 motor function is normal. Be alert for a broad-based, somewhat ataxic gait. That can be a sign of cervical myelopathy due to cervical spinal stenosis and is not usually a sign of lumbar pathology. Finally, 
I come to the diagnosis. If I think that I really do know what the cause of the patient's low back pain is, I'll put that down. But often I don't, and my diagnosis will be low back pain. As I mentioned earlier, Social Security is very concerned about whether there is neurological involvement or not. So in my diagnosis, I'll put down low back pain without neurological involvement or low back pain with neurological involvement and be as specific as I can about the neurological involvement. I'm going to put links in the descriptions to two YouTube channels if you want want to find out more about low back pain and spinal problems. One is to Dr. Brian Sue, who calls himself the Spine Guy, who's an orthopedic surgeon whose practice focuses on spinal surgery. And the other is to Dr. Nabil Ibrahim, who's a professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Toledo in Ohio, who's put out a very valuable plethora of orthopedic videos with a lot on disease of the spine. Well, I hope this has been helpful, and as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible.